Barber, and I'm a toxicologist here at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Florida. Today I'd like to talk about some of the topics that may arise in veterinary toxicology. And while we can't cover every topic that may come up in the course of your practice, I'd like to cover some of the most important and most interesting topics in veterinary toxicology. The first subject we're going to cover is the subject of anticholinesterase insecticides. These are the organophosphate and carbamate insecticides. Organophosphates are derivatives of phosphoric acid. Carbamic, carbamates are derivatives of carbamic acid. These, these compounds have a wide range of toxicity. Uh, some of the carbamates are toxic at as little as one milligram per kilogram, while some of the organophosphates can be dosed orally at several hundred milligrams per kilogram without causing problems. Uh, every, every compound should be treated with uh, respect. As most of the toxicity that we see in animals from these products comes because of either misuse on the part of the owner or improper storage of these compounds. The mechanism of action of anticholinesterase insecticides is to inhibit acetylcholinesterase. And acetylcholinesterase has two important sites on the enzyme, a negatively charged anionic site and a serine esteratic site. When organophosphates or carbamates bind to this enzyme, they bind to a critical residue at the serine esteratic site and once bound to this residue, the enzyme is inhibited and can no longer uh, cleave acetylcholine. This results in a buildup of acetylcholine in the synapse, resulting in overstimulation of the acetylcholine receptor. An important point to note about this bond is that early in the course of, of toxicity, it is reversible. However, after uh, several hours, many of the compounds undergo what is called aging, which results in an irreversible bond. Uh, at the serine esteratic site, an irreversible inhibition of acetylcholinesterase. Now, carbamates do not, do not age and are completely reversible. The signs that we'll see, signs of toxicity that we'll see from organophosphates and carbamates fall into three categories depending on the type of receptor that's being affected. The first category would be muscarinic signs uh, based on effect at the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. And these are the traditional sludge symptoms, salivation, lacrimation, urination, uh, diarrhea, meiosis of the pupils, dyspnea, and bradycardia. Nicotinic signs arising from effects of the nicotine, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor uh, would be, consist of muscle stipulations that usually begin with the face, as it's the most sensitive, generalized tremors across the whole body, as well as muscular weakness as these receptors become desensitized to the effects of acetylcholine. CNS symptoms uh, would be respiratory depression, essentially mediated respiratory depression, not to be confused with respiratory problems due to excessive uh, secretions from muscarinic effects, as well as chronic tonic seizures. And seizures are not an absolute effect of organophosphates, but anytime you see a seizure, it's certainly one of the things that should be in your differential list. As far as diagnosing toxicity of, of anticholinesterase insecticides, Certainly clinical signs are an important part of this. Probably one of the, the, the best pieces of evidence that you can have that an animal is affected by an anticholinesterase insecticide is decreased acetylcholinesterase uh, activity, either in the whole blood or in the brain. In a live animal, obviously, whole blood would be the, the sample of choice. Well, in a dead animal, you'd want to send half of the brain to a lab to get tested. Because it typically takes several days to get results on cholinesterase activity. A quicker way to, to tentatively diagnose anticholinesterase poisoning is to use a test dose of atropine. And this dose would be your pre-anesthetic dose of atropine sulfate, which would be 0.01 to 0.05 milligrams per kilogram. If after giving this dose of atropine, you see typical effects of atropine, dry mouth, uh, nidriasis or widening of the pupils, as well as an elevated heart rate, you would know that it's not an anticholinesterase poisoning. So if you see symptoms of atropine following a pre-anesthetic dose, 
you can deduce that it's not an anticholinesterase poison and it's actually something else. And the gold standard for diagnosing this toxicity would be to find the actual compound by chemical analysis. Now, to treat an antiesterase toxicity, the most important step that you can take is to administer atropine sulfate to alleviate the muscarinic signs of poisoning, especially the, the respiratory problems due to excessive secretions. So you will administer atropine sulfate and dose to effect. Uh, you want to dose until the salivation and the respiratory secretions dry up. And it's important to remember that this atropine sulfate is a muscarinic antagonist. It's only going to affect the muscarinic signs and will not stop the nicotinic signs. So administering atropine sulfate is not going to stop the muscle tremors that are, that are an effect of a nicotinic receptor. Another step that can be taken in treatment of an antiesterase poisoning is to administer an oxine, uh, sometimes called 2-PAM uh, or protopam. Oxines are capable of reactivating acetylcholinesterase before aging has occurred. Uh, so if you can give these compounds early in the course of poisoning, they're often effective. It can reduce the toxicity of uh, the antiesterase insecticides. If seizures are occurring, uh, use of diazepam or barbiturates are, are, are uh, good for, for stopping these seizures and controlling, controlling the animal. An animal that is treated with, with atropine sulfate uh, has a very good prognosis of surviving uh, an antiesterase insecticide toxicity. Probably one of the next most common toxicities that's encountered in small animals is ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is a major ingredient in normal antifreeze, and uh, it's most common that you'll see exposures in the spring and the fall when people are changing their antifreeze. Unfortunately, animals typically like uh, the taste of ethylene glycol. Apparently, it's sweet, and we've actually had cases where dogs have chewed through radiator hoses to, uh, to get ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol acts uh, much like ethanol in the first phase of toxicity and produces symptoms of drunkenness, and so the animal is ataxic and depressed. After the metabolism of ethylene glycol begins, it's converted to glycolic acid, and glycolic acid produces some of the profound acidosis that's seen with ethylene glycol intoxication. And then further metabolism of glycolic acid to oxalic acid produces uh, insoluble calcium oxalate crystals in the kidney and it leads to the third phase of ethylene glycol intoxication, which is renal failure. There are three stages of intoxication with ethylene glycol. And the first stage is drunkenness, which we talk about ataxia, uh, depression. And this usually lasts from a few minutes to a few hours after ingestion and uh, is often not noticed by the owners. The animal will then appear to recover and uh, can enter stage two uh, 12 to 24 hours after ingestion. Uh, stage two typically consists of symptoms of tachy tachynea or rapid breathing, uh, and tachycardia, although sometimes bradycardia is seen. And this phase of, of toxicity is also not observed by either the clinician or the owner. So unfortunately, most animals that present to a clinic with ethylene glycol intoxication present at stage three, which is uh, oliguric renal failure. And the prognosis uh, for animals surviving an ethylene glycol toxicity uh, once they've reached renal failure is, is much less than it is if, it's, if the ingestion is observed and the animal can be brought in soon after ingestion. The diagnosing ethylene glycol toxicity uh, typically consists of, of clinical signs along with, with the presence of, of an acidosis with an anion and an osmolar gap. Uh, and later in the, in the toxicity, crystalluria or crystals in the, in the urine uh, may be seen. Uh, in necropsy, one of the, the classic symptoms is to look for crystals in the kidney itself. And this is an example of uh, what a kidney from an animal that's intoxicated by ethylene glycol may look like. And if you look carefully uh, along the edge of the kidney here, you can see that this has kind of a granular appearance. And these granules, granules are actually calcium oxalate crystals that are precipitated in the kidney. If you look at calcium oxalate crystals under uh, a cross polarizer, they look uh, like this. And this is the actual micrograph from a kidney, 
of an animal that was poisoned with ethylene glycol. And within the, the kidney itself, again, you can see uh, calcium oxalate crystals. This would be a classic diagnostic sign for ethylene glycol intoxication. Now, to treat ethylene glycol toxicity, your goal is to prevent the metabolism of ethylene glycol to the more toxic compounds like glycolic acid and uh, oxalate, and also to, to treat and reverse the acidosis that occurs. So the traditional treatment for, eth uh, for ethylene glycol toxicity is administration of ethanol and bicarbonate. Ethanol is a competitive inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase, which is the first, is the enzyme responsible to for the first step in ethylene glycol metabolism. If you can block that first step and prevent it from being converted to glycolic acid and then on to oxalic acid, you can prevent most of the, of the severe toxicity from ethylene glycol intoxication. Administration of bicarbonate will be uh, used to correct the acidosis that occurs with uh, ethylene glycol, and this can alleviate many of the symptoms uh, uh, especially uh, CNS-type symptoms that, that can occur with ethylene glycol intoxication. There are several newer compounds that can be used to uh, inhibit al alcohol dehydrogenase uh, and replace ethanol. Uh, 4-methylpyrazole and antazole uh, are both effective uh, alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitors that don't produce the type of respiratory depression and some of the toxicity that you can see with ethanol itself. And... Uh, are both, both possibilities for treating ethylene glycol. Okay, another common poison, especially among cats, is acetaminophen poisoning. Uh, this is the compound that's present in many of over-the-counter pain and cold remedies, like Tylenol. Um, the important thing to remember about acetaminophen is that it's metabolized extensively by the liver, and the parent compound is, is glucuronidated and sulfated to, to non-toxic metabolites. Cats are deficient in glucuronidation and are therefore much more susceptible to the toxic effects of acetaminophen than are other animals. Once you run out of glucuronide or sulfate, the liver uses the P450 enzymes to metabolize acetaminophen to more reactive compounds, which then have to be bound by glutathione in order to be detoxified. Uh, glutathione is fairly rapidly depleted in an overdose situation, and that's when toxicity occurs. This is important to remember because treatment is going to involve trying to replace glutathione. The symptoms of toxicity of acetaminophen, uh, especially in cats because they're most susceptible, is going to be methemoglobinemia, so that the blood will no longer be bright red but will begin to take on a brownish cast as you get more and more formation of methemoglobin. Uh, as well as Heinz body formation within the erythrocytes. Uh, because methemoglobin is not capable of, of carrying oxygen, the, the animals will have symptoms of cyanosis and dyspnea as well. And, and for unknown reasons, uh, cats often exhibit facial and pall edema as a response to acetaminophen. You can also see anorexia and vomiting. And uh, typically humans and dogs don't develop toxicity in response to normal doses of acetaminophen. However, in an overdose situation, you, you, you will see hepatic necrosis uh, in humans and dogs as well as cats. This is an example of the facial edema that you may see in a cat that has been exposed to acetaminophen. You see that the face is swollen, the eyes are barely open. This is a liver from a cat that was poisoned with Tylenol, and you can see that there are extensive areas of necrosis within this liver. Um, this animal survived for quite a while and, and allowed time for this liver necrosis to occur. And this is a micrograph of the, of the liver from the previous slide, and you can see that there's, there's evidence of extensive uh, necrosis within this section of liver. To treat acetaminophen poisoning, if you can get to the animal soon after ingestion has occurred, GI decontamination, either by emesis or gastric lavage followed with activated charcoal, is very effective. Um, if you don't get to the animal in time and, and symptoms have begun to appear, the treatment is going to consist of using N-acetylcysteine, which is sold as mucomist, to replenish glutathione and also to substitute for glutathione. It provides another substrate to detoxify the reactive intermediates that are produced by 
metabolism of acetaminophen. Especially in cats, you're going to have extensive methemoglobinemia, and it's important to, to treat this methemoglobinemia so that, so that the blood can again begin to, to carry oxygen. And in cats, you're going to want to administer ascorbic acid to reduce methemoglobin. Uh, methemoglobin. Uh, in other animals, you'd want to use methylene blue uh, to, to reverse the methemoglobinemia. All right, another compound that's commonly uh, encountered with small animals, especially dogs, are methylxanthine toxicities. Uh, methylxanthines are a family of compounds. Uh, within this family are caffeine, theobromine, and theophylline. Uh, it's typically a problem around holidays, which chocolate is, is a big component, such as Halloween and Easter and Christmas. Um, chocolate is probably the most important source of poison within this family, although coffee and uh, theophylline-containing medications are also uh, possibilities for sources of methylxanthines. Uh, unsweetened baking chocolate uh, that's sold in usually in one-ounce squares is one of the most toxic preparations of methylxanthine. Uh, each ounce of unsweetened baking chocolate can contain two to three hundred milligrams of theobromine, and as little as 0.2 ounces per kilogram of body weight can be lethal to a dog. The way that methylxanthines act is by antagonism of the adenosine receptor. Uh, this causes CNS stimulation and the vasoconstriction and tachycardia that uh, are responses to, to methylxanthine ingestion. These are the same responses that you get when you drink a cup of coffee. Uh, they also act by preventing calcium reuptake uh, within the muscle and inhibiting phosphodiesterase. The symptoms of methylxanthine toxicity usually begin with vomiting and diarrhea, so the GI signs uh, predominate initially. Uh, the, you will then see hyperactivity, uh, tachycardia, you can see arrhythmias uh, with, with preventricular contractions and hypertension. Uh, the animal may become ataxic and, and very often you will see tremors or seizures with ingestions of methylxanthines. And eventually the animal can become depressed to the point of coma. To treat a methylxanthine toxicity, uh, it's important to monitor the EKG on these animals and treat any, any arrhythmias that arise. Uh, animals that often die due to, to arrhythmias. Uh, you also want to treat the seizures and control them with either diazepam or a barbiturate uh, to prevent these animals from, from becoming hyperthermic and acidotic as a response to prolonged seizures. Another important class of compounds are the anticoagulant rodenticides. Uh, these rodenticides are, are broken into two classes, uh, termed the first generation compounds, which uh, are things like warfarin. Uh, warfarin has a fairly short half-life. It lasts about 14 or 15 hours in a dog, and, and it's low potency. These early uh, rodenticides require multiple feedings by rats in order to be, to be effective. Because of that, people develop the second generation rodenticides, which are things like brodificum, bromodilone and dipacinone. Uh, these have much longer half-life, uh, 15 to 20 days in the dog, and are very potent. So they, they act on rodents in a single feeding. Um, unfortunately, because they're very potent in rodents, they also are very potent in animals. And as little as a quarter of a milligram per kilogram can be toxic. Uh, the anthropoagulants are usually a problem in small animals. Uh, dogs are the most commonly poisoned. Due to, their feed, due to their feeding habits. Uh, with cats and also with raptors, you can see some problems with what's termed relay toxicosis, which is when a rat uh, eats the poison and then the rat is eaten by the cat or the hawk, and the cat or the hawk may develop uh, symptoms of anticoagulant toxicity due to ingestion, ingesting the rat. Uh, large animals will sometimes exhibit very similar problems uh, if they've ingested large amounts of moldy sweet clover which would contain a compound that called dicumarol, which produces the same effects as the anticoagulant rodenticides. The way that all of these compounds act is to inhibit vitamin K epoxide reductase. Uh, when, when clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 are formed in the liver, uh, the inactive clotting factor is carboxylated uh, using an active form of vitamin K, which is a vitamin K hydroquinone, 
as a cofactor. Uh, after this reaction occurs, vitamin K is converted from a hydroquinone to an epoxide, and vitamin K epoxide is not active uh, and can't be used to form new clotting factors. So this enzyme, vitamin K epoxide reductase, is responsible for converting vitamin K epoxide back to vitamin K hydroquinone to allow it to continue uh, to be useful to synthesize clotting factors. If the vitamin K epoxide reductase is inhibited, the end result is a depletion of vitamin K dependent clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. The result of this is that, that you no longer get effective clotting and you have excessive bleeding in these animals. The symptoms that occur as a result of anticoagulant in, uh, ingestion are those of excessive bleeding. Um, often the, the onset of symptoms is delayed for several days as the, the body consumes the clotting factors that were present before the ingestion. And the initial signs are, are usually just depression, anorexia, as the animal's not feeling good, often due to an anemia, due to small amounts of bleeding. Uh, as the, the toxicity progresses, you begin to see uh, symptoms of pale mucosa, uh, dyspnea, nosebleeds, uh, bloody gums, and, and perhaps bloody feces as the animal begins to bleed uh, from its mucosa. Uh, the animal will often exhibit abdominal pain, and, and typically in an advanced toxicity, there will be uh, severe hemorrhage in, in the peritoneal cavity, as well as multiple hematomas. Uh, under the skin, uh, anywhere that the animal contacts uh, a hard surface, or if you give an injection. It's, it's very important to use care when administering injection to an animal that's been poisoned by anticoagulants, as, as the act of administering the ingestion can cause a severe hematoma to develop. Uh, diagnosing an anticoagulant toxicity is primarily done based on increased blood clotting times. The first the first sign to occur is an increase in prothrombin or PT time, um, and several hours later, uh, an increase in the, the, APTT, uh, the APTT or PTT uh, clotting time will occur also. Um, again, chemical analysis is very effective for these compounds, and submission of a, of a blood or liver or stomach contents to the lab would be useful in identifying an anticoagulant um, in a, a, a toxicity. The treatment of an anticoagulant toxicity uh, consists primarily of replacing the active form of vitamin K. So you're going to administer uh, vitamin K1 to these animals to allow them to begin to synthesize their own clotting factors again. Uh, typically, oral vitamin K is more effective than, uh, than IV administered vitamin K. Uh, However, in animals that are, that are severely compromised, you may need to think about uh, a transfusion uh, initially to get these animals on the way to recovery. Therapy with vitamin K needs to be continued for 10 to 14 days for warfarin and 21 to 30 days for the second generation compounds like brodifacum. So, so treatment needs to be continued for a long time and you should monitor clotting periodically after withdrawing vitamin K treatment to ensure that the animals are clotting at normal rates. Strychnine. Strychnine is something that many people recognize as a poison. Uh, it's an alkaloid that's been used for years to control gophers and moles as well as rats and coyotes. Most states control the sales of strychnine. Uh, unfortunately, it is still used commonly as a malicious poison and, and it's not uncommon to see cases of strychnine poison while you're practicing. All species of animals are sensitive to the effects of strychnine, but dogs are most commonly poisoned, either due to their indiscriminate eating habits or due to annoyed neighbors. Strychnine acts by in in inhibiting the action of glycine at postsynaptic neurons in the spinal cord. Um, glycine is an, an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it's designed to control the firing of the neurons in the spinal cord so if you inhibit the action of glycine, uh, you're inhibiting an inhibitory transmitter, and the result is referred to as disinhibition, uh, which results in stimulation of all the, all the muscles that are innervated by those neurons. Uh, this, this ends up producing the signs that we see of strychnine toxicity. 
The initial signs are going to be anxiety and stiffness. The animal is going to be walking stiffly and, and, and anxious. Um, any small noise may, may it, it elicit much more of a response than you would expect from that. The animal may begin to grin uh, as the, the muscles in its face pull back uh, around the teeth. Uh, this, is, this is very common with strychnine. And then the most common symptom is the presence of violent satanic seizures that are brought on by a sudden noise like clapping your hand or turning on the light. Um, these seizures uh, will last for, for varying periods of time and in between periods of seizures the animal may seem fairly normal uh, until another uh, external stimuli brings on another period of seizures. As the toxicity progresses the seizures will get closer and closer together and the animal, when it is not seizuring, will walk with a sawhorse stance with all four legs stiffly extended. And eventually the animal will become recumbent uh, with persistent rigid extension of all limbs. Uh, all of the muscles are being affected by the action of strychnine, but because the extensor muscles are stronger than the ones responsible for contraction, the end result is, is, is persistent extension. And finally, uh, the animal will begin to asphyxiate because it can no longer breathe due to either the rigidity of the muscles or, or exhaustion of the muscle. So the most important thing to deal with when treating a strychnine intoxication is to control the seizures that are the hallmark of this poisoning. Uh, you're going to want to use either, either pentobarbital, and you're going to have to basically anesthetize these animals uh, with, with the barbiturate in order to be effective. Uh, another option is methocarbamol, which is sold as Robaxin. This is a uh, muscle relaxant that's also effective in treating uh, these persistent seizures. Um, you, the, second, the second goal of treatment is to prevent asphyxiation, uh, and you may need to intubate and ventilate these animals to prevent this from happening, especially if you're using one of the barbiturates to control seizures, as they are, themselves are producing significant respiratory depression. Another another poison that uh, is, is somewhat interesting is metallahyde. Uh, it's sold under brand names like Bug Getta, and it's a slug and snail bait that's commonly used in coastal regions to control these pests. It's usually sold as a, as a bait with three and a half percent metallahyde, and due to its toxicity, ingestion of one to four ounces of the bait is typical to cause toxicity in an average sized dog. Uh, toxicity is most common in dogs, uh, again, because of their indiscriminate eating habits. We had a case of metaldehyde poisoning recently that unfortunately was confused with, uh, with a, 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 an incidence of bioterrorism and resulted in the dog being carried away by the hazmat team. So it's important to recognize some of these more exotic poisonings. Metaldehyde uh, acts by being hydrolyzed to acetaldehyde in the stomach. Um, Acid aldehyde is then further metabolized to acidic byproducts that count for the severe acidosis that's seen with uh, metaldehyde ingestion. And the exact mechanism of toxicity is unknown, but results in uh, symptoms of anxiety and uh, rapid eye movement or nystagmus initially. And this progresses to salivation and vomiting and then to uh, ataxia and seizures. Um, the seizures can result in hyperthermia if they're not controlled. Uh, a profound acidosis is usually present due to the metabolism of, of acid aldehyde to the acidic products. Uh, and the most, the most characteristic sign of net aldehyde poisoning is the smell of formaldehyde on the breath or stomach contents of these animals because acid aldehyde has a smell very similar to net aldehyde. To treat net aldehyde toxicity, Again, you want to control the seizures with either diazepam or a barbiturate. Um, some form of GI decontamination to remove uh, metaldehyde or acetaldehyde from the stomach is very effective. You want to treat uh, the, the acidosis with fluids and bicarbonate. And if, if the seizures have been going on for some time and hypothermia has developed, you want to treat the hypothermia with, with a cool water bath or ice pack. Another rodenticide are those that contain colocalciferol or vitamin D3. Uh, these are widely used as rodenticides, 
and also sold uh, as psoriasis treatments. Some plants, uh, such as uh, cestrum species, also contain vitamin D3 and can cause similar toxicities. Um, toxicity usually occurs uh, at doses above a half a milligram per kilogram, so these are very potent toxins. The way that vitamin D3 uh, compounds act to produce toxicity is first by metabolism to 125-dihydroxy uh, cholecalciferol, which is the active form of, of the vitamin D. So this increases serum calcium by increasing the GI absorption of calcium, uh, decreasing renal excretion of calcium, and by stimulating bone resorption, uh, all of which act together to, to give you massive increases in serum calcium. The signs of, of uh, cholecalciferol toxicity are a result of the increases in serum calcium. Uh, they begin with symptoms of vomiting and diarrhea, and, and then the, the symptoms that, that deal with the kidneys begin to predominate. You'll see uh, excessive thirst or polydipsia, excessive urine production, uh, and the urine will have very low specific gravity. Uh, the kidneys will also begin to become radio-opaque. Uh, as calcium begins to precipitate in the kidneys. Um, you will see a, a severely elevated serum calcium, uh, greater than 11.5 milligrams per deciliter, and also increases in the BUN and creatinine levels in the, in the plasma. Upon necropsy of animals that have been poisoned with vitamin D, you will typically see a mineralization of some of the soft tissues of the body. Um, this is an example of mineralization of the heart, uh, you can see that the, the tissue has become calcified. And this is an example of a kidney, and you can see uh, nodules of calcification occurring in the kidney of this animal, also following ingestion of vitamin D. To treat vitamin D toxicity, your goal is to, to get the serum calcium back to normal levels. And there are basically three steps that you want to take. You want to administer IV normal saline, along with furosemide, uh, this is going to promote the excretion of calcium. You want to stay away from thiazide diuretics, which actually promote resorption of calcium and can increase calcium levels in the blood. The other thing you want to do is administer cortisone, which acts by decreasing GI absorption, uh, promoting renal excretion of calcium, and also decreasing bone resorption. So it is directly counteracting many of the effects of vitamin D. And also, administration of calcitonin, which is a calcium binding uh, compound, this will, will immediately begin to reverse the effects of calcium uh, on the animal. Prolonged uh, effects, uh, prolonged steps that you can take in treating you know, vitamin D toxicity are to make sure that the animal's on a low calcium diet and also to avoid sunlight so you don't inadvertently produce more uh, vitamin D in these animals. Uh, this, is, this is a compound that takes quite a while to get out of the animal's body, and treatment needs to be continued uh, for maybe two weeks or, uh, in, until the calcium stabilizes in the normal range and can be maintained stabilized for, for 24 or 48 hours without further treatment. Lead toxicity. Uh, lead is, is a problem that primarily affects large and small animals as well as waterfowl. Uh, sources of lead uh, include old paint. Uh, when people are remodeling their houses and scraping the paint, they often leave the paint chips lying around, and these can contain high levels of lead. Uh, used motor oil uh, is still a, a potential problem, although with the, with the uh, disuse of lead in gasoline, this is not as much of a problem as it used to be. Uh, some forms of grease contain large amounts of lead, and also batteries, old batteries that are left in pastures, are, are common sources of lead in large animals. Uh, waterfowl, the biggest, the biggest problem is both lead shot and fishing sinkers. Uh, shotgun pellets or fishing sinkers are inge ingested and, and can cause severe lead intoxication in waterfowl. And toxicity with lead usually results from acute uh, exposures to lead, although in humans we often think of chronic problems with lead exposure. In animals, it's usually an acute problem. The mechanism of action uh, for lead toxicity 
it, it's still somewhat unknown for some of the symptoms. Uh, it has many, many different effects. Uh, most of these are based on the, on the fact that lead can interact with key sulfhydryl groups and enzymes, uh, inactivating those enzymes. And lead can also affect calcium regulation. Uh, this is especially important in some of the neuronal, the neuronal tissue where calcium uh, may stimulate the neuron. Lead inhibits an enzyme called delta aminolevulinic acid uh, dehydratase, or d and, and also heme synthetase. These are both enzymes that are involved in heme synthesis and account for much of the hematopoietic toxicity that we see with lead. Symptoms of lead poisoning are usually uh, a mixture of neurologic, uh, gastrointestinal, and hematopoietic signs. Neurologic signs will, will sometimes be the only symptom that the animal will present with, and these may include blindness, uh, seizures, ataxia, uh, head pressing in large animals, in which the animal will repeatedly press its head against an object, uh, and horses exhibit a symptom that is referred to as roaring uh, during breathing. It's a sound they make during breathing as, as the nerves are affected <coughs> that control their breathing. GI signs of lead toxicity um, include anorexia, vomiting, constipation, which then becomes diarrhea, often bloody diarrhea, as the GI tract uh, is being eroded, and, and colic, or, or evidence of abdominal pain. And the hematopoietic signs of lead vary somewhat with, with the animal that's affected. Um, all animals will exhibit uh, an anemia with nucleated red blood cells that are present in excess of what you would expect from, from that anemia. Dogs will often present with, with prominent basophilic stippling of the red blood cells uh, and increased zinc uh, protoporphyrin in their plasma. Cattle uh, will often exhibit increased levels of porphyrins in their plasma, and their plasma may fluoresce because of this uh, if you hold it, their plasma under a, a black light. Uh, diagnosing lead poisoning is done with the presence of clinical signs that are consistent with lead poisoning and it, analysis of whole blood uh, for lead. And if you get whole blood levels of greater than 0.6 parts per million, it is definitely indicative of lead toxicity. Uh, levels of 0.35 parts per million um, can be consistent with poisoning if other, other evidence is present, such as decreased uh, serum uh, aminolevulinic acid dehydratase activity or increased levels of aminolevulinic acid in the urine. Treatment of lead toxicity consists of, of removing uh, the source of lead and, and decreasing the amount of lead that's being absorbed. This is usually done with a cathartic, either saline or mineral oil. Um, if it's a large object, uh, you may need to do some uh, a surgical removal in order to get it out of the GI tract. The second step in treating lead poisoning is chelation therapy. Uh, you have several choices of chelators. The most commonly used one is calcium EDTA. Uh, this wants to be administered as calcium EDTA. If you administer a free acid form of EDTA, you can severely uh, decrease the levels of calcium in these animals and make them hypocalcemic. So make sure you administer calcium EDTA. Uh, another choice is DMSA, uh, or sold as succimer. Uh, this is actually a more effective chelator than calcium EDTA, but uh, it's currently not approved for veterinary use, although there, there are preparations that are present for human use that can be, can be administered. Um, D-penicillamine is a less effective chelator, but it, it is effective orally. Uh, this can be used to, to, for prolonged chelation therapy, uh, when you send the animal home with its owner. Thiamine uh, administration has been shown to improve the symptoms of lead poisoning in cattle. However, it does not uh, promote excretion the way that chelation does and should be used in conjunction with chelation therapy, not as a substitute for chelation therapy. And finally, if the animals are exhibiting severe seizures, uh, the animals will need to have the seizures controlled with some, with either barbiturate for a large animal or diazepam for a small animal. I'd like to wrap up our session today with um, 
a couple of plants that are important in veterinary toxicity. Um, the first type of plants we'll talk about are the oxalate-containing plants. Um, these, these are probably one of the most commonly encountered problems with cats. Um, the first type of oxalate-containing plant we'll talk about are those that contain a preformed calcium oxalate crystal. And uh, many of the, f the members of the family Ariaceae uh, do contain these preformed calcium oxalate crystals, which are present as needles. The, the crystal has a needle shape, and when the animal bites into the plant, the, the, these needle-shaped crystals penetrate the oral mucosa and cause mechanical injury uh, to the mucosa that results in pain, uh, salivation, uh, can produce vomiting, and, and dyspnea sometimes. Um, often the, the, the animals will exhibit a, a, um, a response uh, of the lung that causes uh, increased secretions and uh, this, this result, results in the dyspnea. Examples of, of members of the Ariaceae family would be Diefenbachia, uh, which is sometimes called dumb cane, uh, or mother-in-law's tongue, uh, caladiums, philodendrons, and calla lilies. The other type of oxalate-containing plants are those that contain a soluble form of oxalate. And when an animal eats these plants, the soluble oxalates are absorbed and then uh, combined with calcium and precipitate in the kidney, much like what we saw with ethylene glycol. So the symptoms of ingestion of a soluble oxalate-containing plant would be hypocalcemia, followed by renal injury due to precipitation of the calcium oxalate crystals. Uh, examples of plants that produce soluble oxalates are rhubarb, uh, beet plants, as well as lamb quarter, lamb's quarters. Um, treatment of ingestion of a soluble oxalate containing plant consists first of detoxifying that soluble oxalate by administering a preparation of lime water. Uh, lime or calcium hydroxide in water uh, causes precipitation of that oxalate in the GI tract where it's no longer available for absorption. Um, and then secondarily treating uh, both the hypocalcemia and any nephrosis that develops as a result of ingestion of these plants. Uh, nitrates. Nitrates can be absorbed from plants uh, as well as from fertilizer runoff into water sources for animals. Ruminants are the most, the most susceptible to the effects of nitrate poisoning because the, the nitrate is rapidly converted to nitrite by the, micro, uh, the microbes in the rumen. And nitrite is the, is the form of this chemical that's actually responsible for the toxicity. Nitrite oxidizes hemoglobin to methemoglobin and produces a profound methemoglobinemia. Uh, the symptoms of nitrate toxicity are due to that production of methemoglobinemia um, and consist of, of the, the presence of methemoglobin. The blood, again, is converted to a chocolate brown cast. Um, as the blood begins to develop increased levels of methemoglobinemia, uh, many of the tissues and membranes will take on a brownish cast, and you'll see evidence of cyanosis and dyspnea as these animals struggle to breathe because the methemoglobin can no longer carry oxygen to the tissues. And you can also see tachycardia in response to nitrate toxicity. To treat nitrate, nitrate toxicity, your primary goal is to convert methemoglobin back to oxyhemoglobin so that the, the animals can again carry blood to the tissues. To do this, we want to use methylene blue, except in cats, uh, just like we talked about with acetaminophen poisoning. Uh, cats are, are, are somewhat susceptible to methylene blue, and, and ascorbic acid should be used with cats that are exposed to nitrate. However, in all other animals, you want to administer methylene blue. Methylene blue converts the methemoglobin back to oxyhemoglobin. Avoid overdosing animals with methylene blue. Uh, be very careful when you're treating nitrate toxicity because while methylene blue can reverse methemoglobinemia, too much methylene blue can actually cause methemoglobinemia. And because these animals are having trouble breathing, um, avoid stressing the animal, which would, would put them into a situation that would increase the oxygen demand on their tissues and, and can make the problems much worse. Finally, uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about cyanide. Uh, cyanide is 
primarily found uh, in cyan cyanogenic uh, glycoside-containing plants. Uh, it is also used as a fumigant in some cases, and you can get exposure to a gaseous form of cyanide. However, the, the most common form is ingestion of the cyanogenic glycoside-containing plants. And these are plants like wild cherry and other members of the, the prunus species, choke cherry. Um, also, Sudan and Johnson grass and other members of the sorghum family. These contain cyanide. They also contain nitrate. And arrowgrass is another, another type of plant that can contain cyanide. Uh, ruminants are most susceptible, again, to uh, ingestion of cyanogenic glycosides as the rumen rapidly catalyzes the cleavage of that glycoside and release of, of free cyanide. The way cyanide acts is to inhibit cytochrome oxidase and cytochrome oxidase is an enzyme that's involved in oxidative phosphorylation so it's involved in producing energy by utilizing oxygen. When cyanide inhibits cytochrome oxidase these animals can no longer utilize oxygen to produce energy. Uh, the result are, are signs of uh, the animal being unable to breathe or un unable to produce oxygen. So initially the animals will begin to salivate and their heart rate will go up. Um, then the animal will progress to dyspnea or trouble breathing. The animals become weak. They will often exhibit seizures as well as tachycardia. Death from cyanide poisoning can be very rapid and can occur within 20 minutes to two hours. And the, the classic symptom of cyanide poisoning is cherry red blood that, that either fails to clot or clots very slowly. Uh, the blood becomes cherry red as it becomes over oxygenated. The animal can no longer utilize the oxygen that's present in the blood and oxygen levels build up until they're saturated. To treat cyanide toxicity, um, there, there are two steps that we want to take. Cyanide binds very tightly to, to ferric iron, iron in the plus three state. This is why it binds to cytochrome oxidase. So we have a large pool of iron within the body that's available for binding up cyanide in hemoglobin. So the first step in treating cyanide toxicity is to convert hemoglobin to methemoglobin, which is iron. Methemoglobin has iron in the plus three state using sodium nitrite. So the first step is to administer sodium nitrite, which converts hemoglobin to methemoglobin. And then we can promote detoxification of the cyanide by using uh, sodium thiosulfate. Cyanide is converted to thiocyanate by an enzyme called rhodonase, which uses thiosulfate as a cofactor. So administering sodium thiosulfate increases the detoxification of cyanide. So a two-step process. Uh, sodium nitrite followed by sodium thiosulfate. Okay, that's, that's all the, the, the actual compounds we'll have time to talk about today. And, and I'd like to close by providing with you with a few other sources of information. Uh, several sources of information that are available on the World Wide Web uh, include information from the American Board of Toxicology, which can be found at www.abvt.org. And also uh, a service called XToxNet, which is the Extension Toxicology Network that's administered by Oregon State. This can be found at http://ace.orst.edu/ slash info slash XToxNet. And there's also several books that are available uh, for studying uh, toxicology. Uh, a book here by Gary Osweiler which is a part of the National uh, Veterinary Medical Series Board Preparatory Books, uh, is, is an excellent book that has board-type questions and covers uh, basically all the toxicants involved in veterinary toxicology. Uh, so it's an excellent source of information. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to close. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have on toxicology. And I would encourage you to, to bring questions on subjects that we didn't cover that you may have questions about, as well as those subjects that we did cover in the lecture today. Thank you.